Good morning. Remember to mute your phones. After your salutation, of course, I will take all the good mornings I can get. Good morning. I will say this while we're waiting for everyone to come in. If you've taken any of these sessions before, you know we, we work, right? Because this is about commitment. Um, so if you don't have anything to write with, just I would take maybe 30 seconds or a minute to grab paper and pencil. You'll be tallying some things. There's a, an assessment that I'll have on the screen that you'll be taking. And um, plus you, all, you should always uh, take notes. We don't leave any good word on the floor, be it from me or the wealth of knowledge in the room. Uh, we don't leave any good word on the floor. So just take a moment. If you don't have something to write with, you will need something to write with. And you can go into your phone, go into the notes section of your phone. If you have an older phone, go in like you're drafting an email and you can put notes in there and send them to yourself. Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right. Well, I am going to go ahead and begin. It's 9.02. Look at that. Look at me in here, ready to go at 9.02. No technology issues or anything this time, right? For those of you that have taken some of the other um, sessions with me. So this is great. That gives us a full hour to dive in and do what we do. All right. So if you've been on this journey, um, you know that we've been talking about self-care and this is um, body, mind, spirit. This is work home. Um, I believe in best practices transcend. If they work in the office or the workplace or the school, they'll work in your home and, and vice versa when, if it's a best practice. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. So our learning objectives for today are, uh-oh, my slide is not Felicia, my slides not, did I speak too soon? Okay, here we go, here we go. All right, so our participants will be able to identify characteristics of compassion, fatigue, and develop strategies uh, to promote balance in all areas of life. All right, so what is compassion fatigue? And I can tell you right now, we're gonna have that thing where part of it's gonna cover some of my content um, where you are on the screen and that's okay. I wrote it, so I should know it, right? Okay, so compassion fatigue is a type of stress that results from helping or wanting to help those who have suffered trauma, who have been traumatized under significant emotional duress. Okay, and so when we think about this, we think about dealing with tragedy, right? So I'm gonna break this into parts because we'll, we'll come, we, I wanted to lay the foundation of compassion fatigue and, and what that is. And we've all experienced it in our lives. If you have any level of empathy, you have experienced compassion fatigue, be it, I know um, parents often experience compassion fatigue and don't even realize it. If you have a, child who is going through something, they could be an adult, um, a, a, a child a, a, under the age of 18, it doesn't matter. When you're someone you care about, a sibling, um, a significant other, a parent, when someone that you are close or connected to, even your students suffer trauma and you're helping them through it, um, you sometimes it can weigh on you and you have compassion fatigue. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about dealing with tragedy. Um, and, and there are levels, when we talk about trauma, there are levels to trauma. And so there, there are those of us that uh, suffer incidents and, and don't even realize it's so much a part of our day-to-day, -day, especially our students um, who are, living in, have lifestyles of trauma, and they don't even know. That's just all they know. They were born into it. That's all that they know. Um, and so when you're dealing with tragedy yourself, um, you'll hear me say tragedy, trauma interchangeably. Um, you're dealing with tragedy yourself or with someone else. There's just some basic guidelines that, I, that will help you navigate that space. So ask questions, research, and learn as much as possible about the event or what took place. So for example, when we suffered um, the beginning of the pandemic, 
Um, and we all went different places with it, right? Some of us were, our anxiety was raised. Some of us, we were um, nervous. We were, some were excited because they didn't have to go to work. Wherever you were in that, one of the first things that most of us did was we began to we began to watch the television more often. People who I know I, I'm a streamer. I, I don't watch you know regular news, but I needed to know, and so I wanted to know what was happening in Columbus, Ohio. I needed to know in my service area or in my neck of the woods, even though I, I cared about what was happening in the rest of the world, right? But I needed that information because I knew that if I could ask the questions. Um, or if the questions that most of us had could be answered, it could help me plan. It could, it's, it's, it's kind of how you stay two steps in front of. Um, and so doing your research and learning as much as possible. Um, and, and it's also about timing too, right? So knowing when to ask those questions. So if you're dealing with someone in trauma and you want to ask those questions, you also have to, it's not in the notes, but you also have to deal with an element of timing. When do you ask those questions? Sometimes you ask an open-ended question. How are you? You don't seem like yourself today. Is everything okay? And then you ask clarifying questions. And then you do the research. Um, and sometimes that's through more questions. That's asking other people who are touching that student uh, throughout the course of the day. Are you noticing anything? and learn as much as possible. I need to do something that I forgot to do. So just really quickly, I'm sorry, I didn't lay our foundation. We always lay a foundation in self-care with our gratitude and our affirmation. So I would like for everyone just for a moment, just for a moment to write down your gratitude statement. You can put it in the chat. What are you grateful for today? What are you grateful for? What are you grateful for? I'm grateful that I get to do what I love. I'm grateful to be awake and alert today. Amen. I know that's right. What are you grateful for? This always lays our foundation, right? Because this is our base. This is our anchor. Everything we do, we build on the foundation of gratitude and affirmation. My day at home with my kids, my life, family, and friends. Yes. Grateful that my family has stayed healthy through all this craziness. Yes, yes, for life, family, and friends, life, family, and friends, my family being invited to this day. Grateful for health, grateful for doing PD from home. I know that's right. Grateful for supportive friends and a happy life. Grateful to my family and our health. That's right. Just 30 more seconds. What's your gratitude statement? Put it in the chat. What are you grateful for today? Life and family. I keep hearing that theme. What are you grateful for? Mm -hmm. So that's our foundation, right? Because when it gets rough, when it's difficult, that's how we center ourselves. We come back to, to gratitude. And I don't mean toxic positivity. That's another training. We'll get to that one maybe in part three um, because it's heavily laced in denial. And most people are like, toxic positive? How is that even possible? That's an oxymoron. It's a real thing. Um, but that's not what this is. This is just saying planting your feet in the good of today. That no matter what comes your way, you can come back to your gratitude statement. That's so important. And then next, I want you to do your affirmation statement. So how, what are you affirming about yourself today? I affirm that I am capable, I am equipped to lead this professional development today. That's my affirmation. What are you affirming about yourself today? I'm okay, yep. Grateful for my family and blessings. What are you affirming? Isn't that interesting? I'm good, I am enough, yes, yes. I'm in my right mind, strong and focused, yes. I'm able to perform my job successfully, yes. Absolutely. I affirm that I am enough, yes. So we've got our gratitude statement and we have our affirmation. Mm -hmm. So this is what we affirm. And so this is what we come back to. No matter what we get into today, this is what we come back to. This is our foundation. All right. And those of you on this journey with me, if I forget to do this again, remind me the next time. 
because that's always how we start what we do. Okay, so when we're dealing with tragedy, we also want to acknowledge our feelings, emotions, and reactions. Um, there's nothing more, it, it's disrespectful unintentionally, but there's, there's nothing more frustrating than feeling either anxious or, or whatever um, you may feel, what adverse emotion you may feel, and it not being acknowledged. Um, by someone else, you not knowing how to articulate it. So we wanna make sure that you acknowledge your feelings, um, emotions and reactions. Now, when I teach, I, it's twofold. So I'll say you, because everything's the attitude uh, reflects leadership. So you can't lead young people if, if you're not healthy and whole, right? So we, when you see me say you, it means you, but it also means this is what you would model with your, um, your students in whatever capacity uh, that you interface with them and your colleagues. So you acknowledge your feelings, emotions, and reactions. And you talk to a trusted, confident, or professional. This is not super deep, right? And yet sometimes we skip these steps and they're important. Um, and, and be careful of, I, it, we refer to it as um, an invalidation. Um, when you don't acknowledge the truth of someone else's feelings even if you find them to not be the same as yours, you can't invalidate someone's feelings. You can't invalidate your students. He hurt my feelings. Oh, it wasn't that serious. Oh, there's bigger issues going on in the world. That's toxic positivity, quite honestly. It's, and it's an invalidation. You're invalidating their genuine concern. And some of that is how we're raised um, if, if you grew up in an environment where that happened to you all the time, you begin to model, that's all you know. And so now you're transferring that down with your family, your peers, and you're bringing it into the educational realm as well. So we want to be um, cautious and mindful of that. You want to talk to a trusted confident, confidant or professional. And this is really, really important when we're dealing with tragedy. So in social work, we refer to this as secondary trauma. And that's when, so we've got compassion fatigue, we've got secondary trauma. That means something happened, let's say something happens to one of your students and um, you're walking that journey with them. You begin to, to empathize to a degree that now it's on you. Um, you're, you're carrying it home with you at night. It bothers you it, and right, we're human beings, right? And so that's the good of us. That, that we bear each other's burdens, if you will. Um, but sometimes you need to be able to talk to someone that you trust and you might need to talk to a professional depending on what you do and only you know what you do because there's so many different disciplines represented on this call today. But if you do something that you feel like you are constantly dealing with trauma, whether it's your own or not, you have to have that balance with either that trusted confidant or a professional. So I don't know who that's for, but somebody needs uh, to be speaking with a professional just because of the, the line of work that they're in. They need that balance. I don't know why, is it? All right, give me a second. It's the delay. All right, so our next slide. You want to empower yourself, make a plan for what you can do to help. Now, listen, this is to me and Candy all day long. Everybody knows the way I relieve stress is I, I will plan my way out of everything um, because that's how I feel like I can take control over what I don't have control over. So let's go back to March of 2020. Think about how we were all feeling. And first, let me just pause and honor the lives lost. So when we talk about this pandemic, we're all here, we all survived it. But there's so many layers of trauma that we still, we say this about the students, right? We don't recognize it with ourselves. There's so many layers of trauma of going through that pandemic that we still don't even know the effects that it's had on us yet. Um, and, what, and, and if you go back to that time, we all got, because we're all here, right? So we got through the, the best way we knew how. But when I think about that, I think about, I know for me, I always have to find a way to empower myself. And it's because it's the only way that I can survive and what is what I feel like is powerless. 
And so that is why in an end of life situation, you'll always have a family member who's the doer. So when someone passes away, you've got that person who's like, okay, well, let's get the food. Let's get this. Let's get, we got a plan. What's mama going to do? We got to, those are people that that's how they empower themselves. That's how they can control the uncontrollable. And so, although those are the people sometimes who don't deal with their stuff until it's all done, but I, I, if you know the root of that, it's not, oh, she's so busy or he's so busy. He's, no, it's really rooted in this need to empower yourself to that which you feel powerless. And so I encourage all of you when you're dealing with tragedy, um, making a plan and helping your students to walk through and navigate that as well can be really helpful. I'm sorry that happened to you. What are you thinking you're going to do about this? Well, what if we do that? You know, you help them think um, critical thinking as best they can. And sometimes that's a level of trauma. Think about the pandemic and how we all felt in the beginning. And I can't say like it's over because we're still in it, but at least in the beginning when it was just the, the entire world was on one accord in fear. What a way to be on one accord, but we were on one accord in fear. And so, because we were, we were powerless, we didn't know what we didn't know. Think about young people in trauma who have no power. Young people have no power. And there are incidents and occurrences that are happening to them all of the time and they have no control over it. And so I challenge you to begin to navigate that space with them and how you help them massage their critical thinking skills and how you, how you help empower them where they don't feel quite as powerless. If that makes sense. If this is making sense, let me know in the chat. I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, accept, I'm sorry, I moved the chat. Accept what you can't change. What? What do you mean? You just said to make a plan and be in front of it. Not, but ultimately, you have to accept what you can't change. You can't change the environment. You can't change um, some of the structural determinants. Um, I don't call them social determinants, they're structural because they're rooted in racism. The, the, the structural determinants that um, our families face, you may not be able to change that in your current role, but you can change the environment that they're in when they're with you. And that's for the students. For you, there are some things that you have to accept that you can't change and empower yourself to be in front of the things you can. I'm telling you, so much stress and burnout is due to the feeling of powerlessness. And if we can get in front of, and I say that for my family, I just would probably want to take my mouth because I say that phrase all the time. Let's get in front of it. Let's get two steps ahead. How do we get in front of this? If you can get in front of it, it changes your mindset. It reduces your stress and it reduces your trauma thinking. There's all these love neurological levels to trauma that I would love to dive into. Um, and it takes you from uh, surviving to thriving um, when you can get in front of something. I, I'm having problems with my mouse today. I'm sorry. I have tried to advance this slide. I think I have to tap like three times. Okay, how to reduce compassion fatigue. You gotta know your triggers, know your triggers. Okay, so let me just go here. <sighs> if you are fresh out of trauma and you have a friend or a colleague, colleague who is entering the same trauma that you are coming out of or that you've experienced, the natural tendency is, well, we're, you know, like experiences, we should be um, in this together. I should help them. But <laughs> trauma begets trauma sometimes. And if you don't know your own triggers, um, if you are fresh out of a divorce and your colleague is now walking that journey, as much as you may want to offer advice, the best thing for you might be to step back because you don't know what in that situation 
in your, in your need and your heart to be right, you don't know what is going to now trigger you and take you deeper in the hole with your own issues. So be careful with that because our natural tendency is to pair up. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna be there for her because I've been through this and I don't want anybody to go through what I've gone through. If you have not gone through therapy and extensively for a couple of years, you back off. You gotta know your triggers. Resolve your own challenges and monitor your own reactions to other people's trauma. You've got to monitor that. You've got to know where you are in that. And remember, it's okay to grieve when bad things happen to others. Is this helping anybody? It's real quiet in the chat. Is this helping? Yes. Keep going. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. All right. Absolutely. All right. Demia, you are the best. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm just the Keep best. Teaching, one. preaching, sister. Yes. Teaching, <laughs> preaching. Yes, ma'am. On everything, you are the absolute best. I and I don't mean to keep going, yes, rudely. Like, yes, you, you're making absolute sense. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to hit this slide for the third time. Y'all, y'all be, be with me. Y'all send me good vibes. I don't know why it's so slow today. Um, I'm not at my regular office and it's not advancing my slides. Okay, here we go. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. About to step on some toes, set boundaries for yourself. Now this is, this is, we just gonna go here, right? You have to develop expectations and rewards and be aware of the limitations in your profession and set boundaries for yourself. What am I saying? You know what you're, you, you, by now you know what this job entails, right? The good, the bad, the ugly. And you have to identify ongoing those expectations because conflict is the root of unmet expectations. So you begin to have conflict when your expectations aren't met. So you need to have clear expectations about the rewards and the limitations tied to your job. So for me, when I was a social worker, and I was just sharing this with um, the training group last week, when I was a social worker, um, my business is called Significance, and it grew out of my, my social work background because I knew that not every child was going to be reunified with their families. Not every person who went through recovery would, would stay um, in that sobriety, so the sobriety journey. And you have to learn to live with failure, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you mentor families, that sometimes you just don't get the expected outcome. And so for me, I had to move beyond success to significance and think about, because significance is about impact. So for whatever time that I have with this family, am I kind, am I impact, am I speaking life over them? Am I pouring into them? Am I doing everything I can to make reunification the goal? Did I give this parent every opportunity, because I was in child welfare, to regain custody of this child? Or, or did I give them every opportunity, every resource that I knew so that they could maintain their family? Um, the, the hardest cases were what we call, there were three categories, there's abuse, neglect, and dependency. And abuse is obvious, that's the physical um, or emotional um, and, and unfortunately sexual. And then neglect is uh, like you leave your kid in the car or something like that. But dependency is the hardest because it's that component where life just happens. Um, where you've got a parent who lost her job and now she's homeless, but she's going from home to home and um, the children's services had to intervene because the students were coming to school and um, they didn't have appropriate clothing or, or chronic lice, uh, no matter how many times they tried to get rid of it. And so those are the dependency cases because it's, it's it, for me, those were always the hardest because it was really just families to me almost like dealt a bad hand, like born into. 
Um, and so in those cases, you, you do what you can, you try to build them up, you try to give them resources. And thankfully, I've, I haven't been in social work in over 20 years, but thankfully there's so many resources now. Um, but, but those were always the hardest cases for me. And I really had to just know every day that maybe I, I won't reunify every child. Maybe I won't be able to keep every child in the home, but I'm gonna do my best every day. And I'm going to know those limitations. I'm going to know going in the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to reset my expectations accordingly. Now, what happens is you can set it in resetting your expectations. Here's what you have to watch for apathy. We don't ever want to go from empathy to apathy, but that's, it's, it's almost like you build these emotional calluses to do what you do. And apathy is dangerous um, because you lose the ability to feel and to help. And that's what, and, it, and it's a root of a tree that breeds judgment um, and all kinds of other fruit that don't benefit students, yourself, your family, anybody. So whoever is on this call right now who you know you're struggling with apathy, I don't need you to, to, to go in the chat and say that, but I need you to get some help to deal with that. Because one of the first things that we had to learn in social work is that because you almost uh, it's a whole piece I did called identifying normalcy and because you can have a warped sense of reality if you are dealing with a segmented population all day long in your work then and it's very challenging then you forget that this is just a segmented population and doesn't always represent the whole you have to remember when you're setting these expectations to identify normalcy um, and I, I always give an example in social work, but it's a little, it's a little extreme. I'm not going to say it on here now, but um, when you are removing children on a regular basis and seeing horror, um, you forget and you have to constantly remind yourself that not every um, parent, you know, does drugs in front of their children. Not every, you know, parent molests their children. You, I mean, you constantly have, you, you have to do that. And these are the things that you do. Remember in the first part, I talked about what you do, like on your way home from work, like how do you get the day off of you? These are the things that you need to do. How you reset those expectations in the morning for the good, I believe in the good, I believe in the hope, I believe that today's gonna be a great day. Um, and I am prepared if it's not. Um, you wanna, and okay, so. I think we're good there. Does anyone have any questions before I, I move on? Because I want to meet the need of the room. Yes, um, you made a statement earlier regarding reset your expectations, but I did not get the latter part of that uh, statement. Oh, um, re reset your expectations about the rewards as well as the limitations and set boundaries. So you want to know the rewards of your job, the limitations of your job, and continually set boundaries for yourself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you wanna balance that with professional and personal activities that provide opportunities for renewal. That's so important. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about what do you do as you're leaving work? What do you do? How do you get the day off of you? Okay, y'all know I'm over here punching this at three, Let's see how many times, four times, five times. I am so sorry you're having trouble. I, I really don't know if it's really your area or if it's coming from ours with our technical I don't uh, situation. Know. This, is, this has never happened to me before. Okay, it just worked. Okay, it's, it must yeah. be slow. It's okay. I'm, a, I, you know, with the, the one of the rules I have, and I don't have a lot of rules when I train, is we extend grace. So things happen and whatever we're supposed to get, we get, right? And whatever doesn't show up, maybe we weren't supposed to get it. Okay. Um, remember to avoid, oh, oh. Real, really quickly, just really quickly. In the chat, how many of you have made a crucial decision in the middle of trauma or tragedy and later regretted it? Let me see, looking in the chat, ding. <laughs> Never, ever. Yeah, yeah, we all have. Somebody did it this morning. We all have because we're human, right? Yep. We all have. 
Never, ever, ever. And for those of us who, you know, we have different personality styles, we, we function differently. Um, those of us that are, you know, pretty quick to the draw, um, you have to be so careful. And then there are some that just have more calming personalities. They're reflective by nature. They can step away, come back. Um, I always admire those people. But remember to avoid making big decisions, decisions during tragedy, during trauma. You know, people out here, you know, selling houses, buying houses, right? And, and not realizing, was it a good time to do it? Yeah, it probably was. But there are some people, not everybody, not everybody, who were like, yeah, I think I was just in the pandemic and I just, just looking at my house all this time and I, I really wish that I hadn't sold it. Um, I really wish that I hadn't moved. So as much as, and then there are some people that are like, I, I did it and it was the best thing I ever did. And I would not have realized that we had outgrown this home or that, that we didn't need this much house had there not been a pandemic. So I'm not here, don't anybody get off this call saying to me, I said, everybody that bought a new house shouldn't have, I did not say that. I did not say that. I'm just saying, sometimes you have to be careful. Um, you also want to refrain. And that's just determine other approaches to the issue or concern or an action or event through the lens of others. Oh, I got to park here for a quick second. So when we refrain, all of us have friends that tend to function a little bit like us. Um, I challenge you to have people that are like-minded, but that are not like you. Uh, I call that wise counsel. And for me, wise counsel is a group of people who, you know, my rule, I got to be the, I, I, my goal is never to be the smartest one in my group. They have to be more insightful than I, smarter than, than, than me. Um, they have to come from different walks of life. And they are people who have so much wisdom and knowledge and they're grounded and they've done the work and they're healthy in mind, body, and spirit. And so, because your lens is cloudy, if you have not done the work, you have a cloudy lens. It's like putting on glasses and they're just, you can still see, right? But it's just a little, you don't even realize it. How many times have you cleaned your glasses and you realize how dirty they were until you clean them, right? So when you reframe, and I want us to practice doing this, um, when there's an issue or a concern, when there's trauma, and I'm gonna talk to you about you now, when there's trauma or tragedy in your own life, um, when you're in that issue, always seek wise counsel, always go to people. Um, and I, always, I have this phrase, I always say, is it, is it just me or is it or not? And I took out the just and I say, is it me? Is this me? Um, am I seeing this wrong? And, and, and often they'll say, you know what, I get the way you see it, but I also think it could be this. I don't need somebody to say, mm hmm, yep, you're right. Um, I, that, that makes me a little nervous. Uh, I'm, I'm big on shoulder tapping. I'm really okay with someone tapping my shoulder saying, sis, I know what you're trying to do, but I, but I don't think it came off the way you wanted it to come off. And I believe in who you want to be in this world and what you just did didn't match that. Those are the kind of people I rock with. Those are the people I want in my circle. So when you reframe, when you're determining your approach to an issue or concern, an action or an event, don't just look at it from your lens and don't just go to your significant other or your children or the, these are all the people that are like mini me's. Get away from your mini me's or, or your, your maxi me's, you know, meaning those people are where you got it from. Mini me's got it from you. Maxi me's are people you got it from. And go to some other people and just get fresh perspective because it'll help you. Like we've all learned to um, put that, leave that email in draft for 24 hours before you send it. And then you go back and look at it and be like, oh no, mm -mm, I can't send this. I can't send it. Um, yes, I tell my daughter this all the time. Yes. So that's just something. These are the things I'm telling you, they work in every aspect of your life, but they work in tragedy, especially. They work in tragedy. They work in when you have secondary trauma from your job, it messes with your lens of what's normal 
and it you develop triggers that you're not even aware you have. Okay, so now we're going to do an activity. If it lets me go to that slide. And I'm going to make this bigger on my screen. So remember I said I wanted you to have pencil and paper. Um, so just really quickly, I'm gonna give you three minutes and you may not get to all of these and take a picture of this. You can screenshot it. I can send the, um, the PDFs to the training department to send to you. Um, and this is from um, um, a, a social work. Uh, it's a social work assessment for social workers. Um, and so, and these are your personal reflections. So list three work-related stressors. List three personal stressors. List three ways you know you are stressed. List three ways that your coworkers know you are stressed. List three ways that your loved ones or friends know you are stressed. List three methods at work by which you manage your stress. List three methods during non-work hours by which you manage your sweat, your stress. List the first name of coworkers who are part of your work-related support system. List the first name of loved ones or friends who are part of your support system. Just take a couple of minutes and fill that out. And then what I'd like to do, um, if you use the raise hand feature, and Felicia, if you could work with me on that and we can see who the first person is that raises their hand, I'm going to ask one person to share from every area, if possible. And to me, some of the keys to this is like the third one, list three ways you know you are stressed and three ways that your coworkers know you are stressed. Because stressors change and what they are this month may not be what they are next month, but like the, the, the three and four, like this part here and this part here, if you know what your stressors are, know, what you, know when you're feeling stressed, it'll help you. So I'm gonna be quiet and I'm gonna give you about three minutes to complete this. Um, hey, Ms. Demia. Yes. I'm not sure. I got host privileges. I'm not sure how. Do you want me to transfer them back to you? <laughs> Let me check on that. Um, okay. I'll see what I can do. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I just need you to offer restraint and not share screen. I'm being facetious. Okay, another minute. Miss Bree, I'm so sorry. Are you able to transfer um, it back because it took it from me? Yes. Yes, if you okay. can return it back to me, that would be great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Bree. Okay, so we're looking for the hands raised. This is where it's interactive. Okay, I see T. Shelton or Chilton. You can come off mute. Would you like to take the first one and list three work-related stressors? Um, three work-related stressors. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Perfect. Okay. 
the administration, the children's behavior, and maybe the support systems that are in place. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to answer the next question? List three personal stressors. Matthew? Yeah, hi. Um, <laughs> I was trying to think of three, but um, a lot of them tend to funnel into one, which is kind of just being overstimulated um, in general, whether it be like mentally, physically, not, um, I guess maybe not getting enough sleep the night before. And so having that either fatigue and overstimulation kind of puts me on stress. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. OK, so, Matthew, you know, we, we're going to be, you know, you already know what your goal is, right? Because we always have a, a goal that we set. So uh -huh. do you have the calming? Do you have the calm app? Um, you know, I don't know if I do or not. I think I intended to download it and I mm -hmm. forgot. OK, well, we clearly know one of your goals. <laughs> because some, some are easier than others. And that one's not as easy as it may appear. But once you once you commit to that journey, mm -hmm. then you will find your breathing, you will unplug, you will improve your um, sleep hygiene. I had a sleep study one time and the doctor talked about sleep hygiene mm -hmm. and it's not about bathing. It's the whole system for how you prepare your body for slumber to slumber. Mm -hmm. the whole process. Um, so, okay. Thank you for that, Matthew. No um, list three ways that your coworkers know you. Oh, I'm sorry. List, list three ways you know you are stressed. And you don't have to have three. List three ways you know you are stressed. Anybody? Okay, Lee. Hi, Demi. I just really appreciate you. I just wanted to tell you every time you just, you know, you have just like I needed this today. Mm. So, and I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. But uh, how I know I'm stressed and my coworkers, was that the question? It could be. Yep. You can do both. Okay. Well, I feel like my coworkers know that I'm really stressed is when I'm, you know, always saying, you know, I'm sorry over and over for, uh, you know, working with the child and just, you know, you try so hard to get to them and sometimes you can't. So that I, for me, that's kind of the biggest one, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, that I can't, that I can't help the student or, you know, um, I guess I am an empath. What can I tell you? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it hurts sometimes. So, yeah. Yep. I'm sorry. That's a big one. That's a big one. Thank you for that. Thank you, Demia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see Greer. Yes, I cry. Mm. My coworkers know when I'm really stressed because I cry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. I can relate. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for this today. Mm -hmm. Breathing is going to be really helpful for you, Greer. Breathing. Um, and I mean intentional breathing. We did some of that the, in, in, the, um, in part one, where we did some breathing exercises, learning how to breathe, hold, and release. That's going to be really, really helpful. I'm a crier too. Um, and it, the, the older I get, the, the harder it is and it, and, and, and it's stress. And if you upset me, um, I, I cry like really, really hard. And so I learned to just a lot of techniques for that. Um, but I get it. I so get it. Thank you for your, your transparency. Cheryl. Have a teacher. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. 
we have a teacher at school that made one of the little rooms off the library into a wellness room. Mm. And it's just some of the inversion chairs where you can relax. And there's like the um, little battery operated candles. And you can just go in there and sit for five or 10 minutes sometimes to just unwind. And sometimes I find myself in there a little more than I probably should be. But it's just a great getaway for us to take five or 10 minutes to ourselves because it is really, really very important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Cheryl, and then we'll move on to the next activity. Cheryl? Anxiety. I mm -hmm. have a lot of anxiety and then that's when the crying comes and then the avoidance because the anxiety gets so overwhelming to the point where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. So I do have to step away. You know, even I have the amazed, the most amazing coworkers who would see it and will grab me, give me a hug and say, I got this. You just step away for a moment. Go do something, go take a break, go walk mm -hmm. around. So that's mine, my anxiety. And so it's, so that's where mine is at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling everybody, if you don't have the Calm app, get the Calm app. And it's good to know that. And it's good to know, even with anxiety, there's so many um, levels to it. And so it's also beginning to know physically. If you can feel your heart racing, if you can feel, um, for everybody it's different, but start to pay attention to the things that are happening because something's happening before the tears fall, something else has already happened. And if we can start to go back and identify those steps, we can, we can catch it before the tear falls. Not that there's anything wrong with the tear falling. And sometimes it needs to be that, but I'm starting to notice I can just feel it. And sometimes my heart will beat faster. Um, and I can feel it. And uh, I felt it yesterday. And I was like, I just, I need to step back. I need to, to think my way through. I, I was uh, listening to the Hamilton CD when I was working out. And there, there's that part in the, in the movie where um, it comes out about him and the, the, his um, indiscretion. And, and he decides, which was not wise, but he decides, what is my strength? I can write my way out. And he decides he's going to write his way out of it, which was a bad decision. But I do like that. He was like, here, let me tell you what, let me tell you what I do well and how I'm going to use that. I'm going to use what I do well to get through this situation. Now it was devastating to everybody else, but eat the meat and throw out the bone. There's some good in that, that I think you, if you go back to remember, that's why we, that's why we lay the, the groundwork with gratitude and affirmation. If you can go back to your strength, like I know I'm a planner. I know I can plan my way out of anything. Then that's when I go back to, okay. So I'm feeling some anxiety. So let me plan how I'm going to deal with this. Even in your anxiety, um, whatever your strength is, I know I'm an empath. So, and that's why you have to, in, in this line of work, it's very similar. You have to shift from success to significance, which is how am I going to impact um, this student's life? How am I going to impact my building? How am I going to impact my colleagues? Because we may not get the expected outcomes that we want. So instead of, even though that's always our big picture, but what are the very tiny steps that I can take? I want to press because I want to get to this next activity. Because if we don't do anything else, oh, oh, I don't know what's happening today. All right. Now, this is going to be hard. I just need you to extend grace, right? You're going to look at this. I'm going to leave it up on the screen. This is older. You can see down here when this was done. So there's so many others that we can put in here, but then there's some stress that just doesn't change. So I want you to go through here and you're going to add all of these up. Any of these that affect you. So death of house, you're going to put 100 and then just go through, put as many of these that apply with the numeric value attached. And then tally them all up. 
and I'll give you five minutes. Well, let's try to do it in three, but if you need a little bit of time, I understand. Um, hi, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, this looks like it includes like positive life changes as well. Is that right? Yes, because there's you stress and EU stress and distress, but it's still all stress to the body. Neat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I use the example. It's like when you're um, running a race and you have all that anxiety before the race starts for get down in the blocks and um, it, it's still that adrenaline. Adrenaline is um, can be rooted in something positive, but it is still sending signals to your brain and your body that there is stress. It's funny, some of these marriage is 50. Like, we're going to give you 50 just for being married. Like, just just because you got somebody, we're going to give you 50 right there. So true, Demia. <laughs> Christmas, oh, you see Christmas on here for 12. And you can put in whatever your um, religious holiday is, if it's Hanukkah, um, whatever you celebrate. All right, we're going to do. To me, I have a question. I hope I'm not talking over anyone. Um, can you like add in maybe like your daughter in laws, like your son in laws, if there's an issue? Absolutely. I think it's on here okay. for family. I'm looking for it. Um, and if it's not added in there, how many points? Oh, I don't know. That's for you to decide. <laughs> Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry if I interrupted anyone. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, they should have one for just children. 100 points, children. All right. I'm going to press on. Take a picture of this. Take a picture of this if you didn't get to finish, but we, we only have until 10 o'clock. So begin to tally. You should be tallying your scores now. Trouble with in-laws is 29. Mm -hmm. and, and think about it. These, these numbers are, this was 1979 um, when this was first done. I am going to believe that my slide will advance. I am going to believe that my slide will advance. Okay. All right. I want to get to the interpretation. So if you, uh oh, if you scored between 150 and 199, your current level of stress can't, could uh, increase, and or you do not um, adopt, if you do not adopt effective management strategies, um, and you have a 37% chance of a minor illness in the future. I need to change, I need to see if I can change my view so I can see. Um, the rest of that because I don't want to Okay, yeah. Okay, if you score between 200 and 299, if your stress level continues to, to uh, at this pace and you don't do anything to change, 
you have a 51% chance of developing a major illness. Stress is so linked to um, illness, it's unreal, which is why if you have someone who's born into poverty, who is from an underrepresented, marginalized community, that's why you have these structural determinants of health. If you scored over 300, you have a 79% chance of a health breakdown in the next two years. And it is recommended that you seek help and effective coping strategies to improve your lifestyle. So I want you to ponder these questions. Does your score seem to accurately reflect the level of stress in your life as you see it? Why or why not? Take a picture of this so you can reflect back on this later. What does your perception of life events have to do with the effects of stress on you? Does your current level of self-care enhance your stress resiliency or leave you vulnerable? Because you stress, EU, there's you stress and distress. You stress like, like shopping for Christmas or, or Hanukkah or you know, a major holiday. Is um, planning a vacation. Anybody come back and say, I need a vacation from my vacation? It is still stress to the body. Okay, knowing your trigger signs. Um, and oh, that was in the wrong place, I'm sorry. Tips to reduce burnout. Write things down, make small daily decisions. Listen, if you don't get anything else, Learn to make small daily decisions. If you tackle the small, remember how you're looking at that long-term um, um, outcomes? Sometimes you can tackle it if you know the end goal, but if you take it day by day. See the decisions you are already making. Give yourself permission to ask for help. Ask for help. It doesn't mean that you are incompetent. It means that you, you recognize your capacity and plan for your future. Now, you know, to me, I always got a plan. If I don't do anything else, I'm gonna have a plan. Get the most information you can to make decision, decisions. Sometimes that will help you with your burnout. I'm telling you, it does. Anticipate your needs, the needs of your students, your staff, and your own needs, your family. Um, right now, there's again, conflict is the root of unmet expectations. And so now I'm starting to have conversations with my family about, let's talk about your needs. Tell me what you need. Tell me what you, I, I went on vacation with my husband and realized as much as I love being by the beach and sitting out in the sun all day, he does not. And he was like, yeah, I think this is the last time I'm going to vacation in this way. And I was like, what? I, I mean, we sat outside, just listened to the ocean for hours. And he was like, yeah. And I didn't enjoy it. And I was like, what? And I was like, well, tell me how to meet your need. And he was like, I really wanted to rent a Lamborghini and just drive all over this. And I was like, that's good to know. That's good to know. But when you ask me, you ask, hey, would you like to rent a Lamborghini? And I said, no, because I didn't want to. And I said, so for me, it was like, anticipating that need right and making it like you know and also learning how to ask the right questions because he asked the wrong question no I didn't want to do it but if he would have said hey I want to rent a Lamborghini and drive around Florida would you do that with me I would have been like of course I'll do it with you not that I'm excited to do it but I'm excited to do what excites you right anticipating needs is so important remember you have options Always remember you have, oh, it's 10 o'clock, it's 10 o'clock. Review previous successes. That's so important. For every loss, you got to know your wins because they're foundational. Problem solve. Have a plan B. Mia has a B, C, D, E, F, G because I'm a planner. That's how I, that's how I manage my stress. Um, break large tasks into smaller ones. You'll get a copy of this. Say no to extra responsibility. Somebody on this call, you know who you are. Say no. Just because you can, um, you know, as a, as a religious, somebody who's a, 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 I'm a woman of faith. And so I always say, is it a, is it a good thing or a God thing? Because there's a difference, right? Because I 
can do it doesn't mean I should do it. Everything you can do doesn't mean you should be doing it. Okay, I, I need to honor the time here. I know you all have to go. Um, we'll, we'll do this later where you take out the sheet of paper and put the yes and the no's on that. We're gonna leave with that in my next training. We're gonna leave with that because we never get to this one. Um, okay, identify at least three areas of growth, opportunity for self-care based on your assessment score. And remember, I leave you with this. You have to secure your own ox oxygen mask. You know how you fly and they tell you, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. You can't help anyone else, oh ye of compassion fatigue, until you put that mask on yourself first, right? I appreciate all of you. Go and be well. This will be a continued series. Know that you always need to have pencil, pencil and paper because we're going to learn, we're going to grow, and we are going to commit to this self-care lifestyle. It's not selfish. Remember, it's self-filled. We are we're full. We're getting full. Okay? Little steps at a time. Baby steps. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you so much. I see you in the chat, and I honor it all. Thank you so much. Miss Candy, this is Felicia. Did you state that you're going to be sending your PowerPoint to the training and development team for di distribution? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I will go ahead and end it for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.